Hello and welcome to the weekly commodity market update. I'm Brownfield's Will Robinson, joined as always by the University of Missouri's Ben Brown. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Will. How are you? Uh, doing well, doing well. We got up a little bit earlier than normal this morning. So uh, Ben and I, if we're not the sharpest in the world yet, that's probably my fault because I'm a little bit groggy, I guess. But uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So uh, that dang Eastern time, too. Yeah, it, it's it, it's really kind of a pain sometimes. I'm just thankful that, you know, you're not in, in Mountain or Pacific time or, you know, or some combination of something different because yeah, that's all one right. hour is good for us to get up early. Yeah, I was going to say one, one hour is not too bad to deal with. But once you get further out than that, it's, it's kind of annoying. But no, it's uh, yeah, it's been good otherwise, though. So. Uh, ben, I, I guess really without delaying too much today, what uh, what what have we really been seeing from the markets this past week? What adjustments are, are we seeing? Yeah, well, so I can sum it up as down across the board, really, for the commodities we look at. Primary reason for that is a lot of those headlines that we had talked about last week or two weeks ago on this program um, have kind of worked themselves out of the markets, or at least currently uh you know there's still geopolitical risk out there but a lot of those headlines have kind of waned as well so um, a lot of that premium has worked its way out of the market as well may corn uh down 27 cents to 649 new crop corn for december down 20 cents to 546 may soybeans down 52 cents to 1465 november soybeans down 40 to 1271 soybean oil was down almost two cents per pound on the week soybean meal was down 26 dollars per short ton old crop wheat was down 55 cents to 641 july wheat down 52 to 655 and then that west texas intermediate crude oil was down just about three dollars per barrel uh, to trade, just above seventy eight dollars per barrel. So, Ben, with all those losses, even with a relatively quiet week, what's really been leading the way down? What what uh, what's the market been trading on? Well, I think you just called it. Actually, I think it, it was a relatively quiet week. It's nice to see you know commodities start to trade fundamentals uh, over you know, some of these major headlines. Uh, we saw you know a partial agreement uh, with. Ukraine and some of its neighboring countries to allow grain to flow through that. We'll see what happens over the weeks to come. We've probably got about another, oh, I'm going to say five to eight days um, if if an agreement isn't made in that Black Sea region before uh, we really have to start worrying about grain not flowing through that country. So, uh, or flowing out of the Black Sea due to the deal or across land. So we got we got some challenges there still ahead, but. Uh, U.S. energy energy stocks were mixed on the week. Crude oil and distillate stocks were down week over week, while ethanol and gasoline stocks rose. Gasoline demand was down 5%. U.S. ethanol production rebounded 19 million gallons to trade above 300 million gallons for the first time in two months. With the disc- decrease in gasoline disappearance and increase in ethanol production, ethanol stocks increased, putting pressure on ethanol prices. Old crop corn and soybean export sales both disappointed this week. Um both fell short of trade expectations and sales from the comparative year. The corn sales were a three-month low, uh, so tapering that pretty hard. Corn cattle on feed, as of April 1st, came in just slightly above expectations, uh, roughly about 95.5% of last year's volume. Open interest and open position, excuse me, open interest futures and option positions for Chicago soybeans fell 3% again this week. Uh, while corn was slightly up in Chicago, wheats were nearly flat. Managed money positions were nearly up across the board. The exception soybean oil, which increased, or excuse me, with the exception of soybean oil, so Chicago corn increased by 22,000 positions, um, while soybean meal decreased or increased by 10,000 on their net longs. Uh, U.S. ag export volumes this week were all within expectations, uh, with wheat up week over week, while corn, soybeans, and grain sorghum were all down. And then USDA's crop progress report on this week showed that 14% of our nation's corn is planted. That was up 6% on the week um, and above the five-year average. So, Ben, uh, uh, one of the things you mentioned right there, and I just want to have a little bit of, a, I guess, a clarifying thought. Whenever we're seeing open interest on these contracts maybe falling back a little bit, does that signify anything specifically? Um, what, what does that really tell you as you're looking at the markets? 
Yeah, so that tightens the volume. That can create some increased, you know, reaction if something were to change. Uh, there's there's less volume to trade on, and so therefore you, you can have bigger swings. Dramatic, uh, so that's dramatic. that's really kind of what we're looking at there. Is is you know how much cushion is there to absorb some of these price shocks if they do happen? And so Chicago soybeans have uh, fallen six percent over the last two weeks, uh, which is a pretty big move uh, for for that complex this time of year. Yeah, well, it was just something that kind of caught my attention. And, and I was thinking, you know, whenever we're, we're looking through the, these contracts and we're, we're trying to better understand the direction of the market, um, it, you know, we talk about the susceptibility of the market of having these larger swings and, uh, you know, the tightness that we've seen over the last several months. And it's just I, I thought that was something that was kind of notable whenever you're looking at, you know, how producers, how can um, I, I guess market players might be viewing the markets. So. As that gets tighter, you know, as that that uh, open interest drops, uh, uh, you know, obviously, like you said, I'll get a little bit more dramatic. But how do you see that trending, uh, I guess, as we close out the month of April? You know, you said that's a little bit odd for this time of month. Yeah, good question. So this is, uh, you know, the time of the year where we start to see farmer selling patterns kind of start to to build. Um, so you start to see, you know, more trade with uh, merchants um, as they're kind of hedging their their bets and their positions as well. Um, so we tend to see you know a little bit more activity starting about you know middle of April as as producers are planting crops uh, in the ground here in the northern hemisphere. So a little bit more activity. Uh, the fact that Chicago soybeans fell three percent is kind of counter seasonal, um, but certainly I anticipate that to build back over the next couple of weeks. So, Ben, today our main topic that we're really going to be talking about is diving back into the supply chain, trying to see what, uh, I guess, adjustments we've seen over the long term and some issues we're seeing currently in the short term. So, you know, it's been no secret that we've seen large swings in commodity prices because of uh, supply chain hiccups over the last several years going back to the pandemic and even before that, looking at the trade war uh, and things like that. So, Currently, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, w- what I think is an overall, I guess, bettering of the situation, but that doesn't bar um, the overall supply chain to being susceptible to, uh, I guess, one-off events or, you know, different events that are impacting it. So currently, we're, we're seeing some, I guess, closures of uh, locks along the Mississippi River and the upper Mississippi River Basin. So, Ben, h- how does that really impact, uh, you know, the supply, the movement of grain this time of year? you know, still looking in April when maybe there's not a lot of grain necessarily moving through those those areas, but it's still something to keep an eye on. Sure. And I think that was a great way to put it. I, I think that's exactly what I'm going to say is this isn't a, a normal time of the year where we're we're depending on the river for, for much product movement, whether that's up or down. Most of the fertilizer products that are going to come to the Midwest are already here. A lot of the grain that we have to ship is is already out, so you know it'll it might impact basis values um, a little bit uh, in the northern part of the Mississippi River Basin. Um, but you know this is a time of year where we we do see some flooding from from time to time. Every I don't know, let's say five years, uh, we get we get this kind of period in the spring where the snow is kind of falling and the river levels rise. I think what's unique about this is just how much water there is coming out of the northern plains, but all that snow and all that you know that uh, rainfall um, is is finding its way down the river so and it's turning the rivers at least in the southern mississippi it's it's you know got the rivers back to a healthy level and really i guess looking elsewhere too we're we're seeing some i guess tensions uh, rise up along west coast ports uh, we're seeing that the u.s transportation secretary pete Buttigieg get involved and make some comments on the situation so Ben, do you see, you know, situations like this, and it kind of reminds me of the, the you know, discussions around a railway strike that we saw a few months ago. Uh, w- what's your, your, I guess, grasp on the situation on what's going on along the West Coast and how that might impact exports as they're leaving those areas? Yeah, so it is similar to the rail dispute. Um, probably, and I don't have any data for this, so this is one of those things I shouldn't say, but you know, the rail thing was directly impactful to agriculture, um, and especially our Midwest crops. Um, these labor disputes on the West Coast, uh, they have an impact in ag, but it's it's a lot of fruit, vegetable, and sometimes meat products that are shipping out of containers, and, and especially cooler containers, right? Um, we do export 
you know, some ag products via containers, but you know, it's, it's, uh, there's other channels to do that. Uh, we can either send them down through Savannah, we can send them through, um, you know, the other ports, uh, different parts of the country. Um, and so, you know, these, these, this kind of labor discussions and, and, you know, strikes on the West coast are, are impactful, but they're where they probably really impact us is in the products we buy that come from from overseas. Um, so we're probably more impacted as consumers uh, than some of our ag producers here in the Midwest. So I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I guess kind of playing that out, extending that along, does that maybe, I, I guess, add support to, uh, I guess, the do domestic market if that's going to you know, uh, impact imports more than exports looking at uh, the overall grain supply in the U.S.? Probably not. I don't think we're going to see much of a change um, from this would be my general you know, assumption is I think, you know, it's not a typical time period of the year. The grain we do import in this country comes a lot in uh, primarily in through the eastern southeast part of the, the country. Coming up from um, it's South grain America. coming in to feed the livestock. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to impact commodity trade all that much. Now, if it continues to spread, we see broader labor strikes across the country, then yes. But um, the rail strike had a had a you know a proportionally bigger impact on us than than what we're seeing in the West Coast just because of the nature of our product flows. Well, and really, I think it'd be interesting if, I guess, you know, someone at me <laughs> would have to do a deep dive on this um, in the next week or so or, or a couple of weeks. But I, I wonder what, what the, the change uh, among, I guess, workers might be or if there is a change from, you know, the, the issues we saw during the pandemic, the supply side issues, and then maybe an opportunity for workers to, I guess, push for, you know, higher wages, better working conditions you know, whatever causes labor disputes are the main back, main, uh, I guess, driver behind these disputes. And I, I wonder if this is going to become a little bit more common for the, you know, near term, whenever we're looking at um, supply worker, um, uh, I, I guess, related hiccups within the market. Sure. I, I mean, we've been seeing these for a year now, right? Uh, we've had, you know, all the labor disputes and, and some of the other uh, other work workforce uh, areas. So, like, you know, rail, we talked about rail, we talked about, uh, well, we haven't, but, you know, like we had all the equipment labor negotiations with Case IH and John Deere, you know, a year ago or so, right? So we've been seeing these. Um, it, it's not something new. It's It's been happening for a while now. So Ben, looking ahead, you know, obviously this past week is pretty fairly quiet within the, the you know, commodity complex. But looking ahead, uh, do you expect some of that to continue or uh, I, I guess what other reports things should farmers and ranchers really be paying attention to? Yeah, we've got another quiet week. It scared me a while ago when I was preparing for this that uh, next Monday is already May 1st. Um, so I don't know what happened to April, but it's gone evidently. So um, we're going to try to make the best of the next couple of days uh, left in this month, but a pretty tame week, uh, you know, next Monday, uh, we do have a couple of USDA, you know, demand reports that are set to come out. The fat and oil seed uh, report, which gives us an indication of crushings for oil seeds, and then the grain crushing, which gives us uh, kind of an indication of food use uh, in the corn sector, as well as you know, kind of reconfirming some of those those rates or conversion rates from corn to ethanol on the corn side. So. Um, that is the rest of this week. I will note that the Federal Reserve is also set to meet here in the next 10 days, and, and that'll have um, you know all traders watching that as well. All right, Ben. Well, it's always a pleasure having you on here and getting to uh, comb over your, your vast levels of knowledge when it comes to grains and oil seeds. Viewers, listeners, if you'd like to learn more about what we do or our sister program, the Weekly Livestock Market Update, you can do so at brownfieldagnews.com. Ben, thanks again. I'm Will Robinson on Brownfield. <laughs>